Googs house. All right. Y'all asked, we got answers like how hot is that hat, hot seat? What is the big deal with the Big 12? And a whole lot more, including baseball hirings and firings and what the. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougs, the daily podcast all about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach, Parker Andrews. Here to break down all things Cougs. If you're a U of H fan or just a hater came to step by, please be sure to subscribe down below. That way we get the latest on the Cougs in the your news feed each and every day. We appreciate you making Locked On Cougs your first listen of the day. Welcome back to the YouTube channel every day here. It is good to see you again. Happy day after Memorial Day. I hope you enjoyed a Memorial Day off. Remember, we're bringing you the latest in the Cougs each and every day here at Locked On Cougs. We are doing a giveaway every 250 subscribers, so make sure you hit subscribe, download, get us there, and then like and comment to make sure you're in the contest at 1250. We're giving away, and we're dangerously close to 1250, a hat just like this. Cougar Paw, Locked On, all that good stuff. Nike Dry Fit hat. Good for on the go and cheering on the Cougs and showing off your locked on swag. If you're looking to for something to comment about after this episode, and you're kind of twisting and turning after all the different angles of the mailbag Monday on a Tuesday episode, and you don't know what to say, tell us if coffee is really just a bean broth. All right, so today's episode, we're going to do uh, answering some questions from the audience. Uh, remember, you can always email lokookspod at gmail.com if you have questions, comments, or concerns, or you can like and comment on the videos. You can find me on Twitter at painsworth 512 painsworth512, P-A-I-N-S-W-R-T-H-512. Also ask questions. We got a handful of questions in this week, um, and some of them are interesting enough to pull out. One of them is actually from last week when we did this, um, and I didn't get to it in last week's episode, so I want to make sure I saved it. That one, I believe, is going to end up being in the second segment. Um, but first... Let's start off with Alex in Cyprus. Alex asked, uh, what do you make of Dana Holgerson's hot seat talk heading into the Big 12? How hot is his seat really on a scale of 1 to 10? So um, I guess we should probably start with the original quote and back up here a second. Now, he said that there ain't no bleeping hot seat in my mind. Um, he actually said it, obviously. Actually, more specifically, I should say he told the Athletic that we won 20 games in two years. We won bowl games in back-to-back -back years. He has five years left on his bleeping contract with a possible buyout. Uh, and there ain't no bleeping hot seat in his mind. There just ain't. Now, I think several of these things are worth mentioning. He is correct that they have won 20 games in the last two years um, and that there are five years left on his contract with a giant, uncharacteristic kind of buyout for Houston. I mean, that to say that there wouldn't be likely that Houston would um, buy out someone with that size of contract buyout. Um, he also, for this worth, did navigate the COVID season of absences and all the thing that was within his uh, career record here at Houston and the Der Derek King fiasco and him leaving after four games to go to Miami. I uh, kind of used to those four games as a showcase. If you don't remember uh, before filing for his red shirt and leaving the university of Houston. Um, and despite all of that, he is 27 and 20. Um, I do think that there's more heat to his seat than um, he might understand there to be because some degree frankly all coaches are hot hot seat right the famous saying i think it was bill walsh was like the only two only two types of coaches in the world those that are about to be fired or those that are right like everyone is constantly on a hot seat in that industry and houston did go eight and five last season which again 12 and two the year before so they won 20 games the last two seasons but expectations for last season were more than eight wins uh, much much higher in fact we were talking about like new year's six bowl game uh, at the end of the year um you know dana is also going to point out and talk about last season that houston lost a handful of really close one score games those games could have gone either way theoretically right if you lose one score game different call here different play there make that catch make this run make that tackle suddenly the games are different um instead he, you know, talks about like they didn't quite all go their way. Houston goes eight and five. I would also add that, you know, in keeping the seat somewhat warm, um, frankly, they won several one score games. I mean, the bowl game against Louisiana, the Temple game with the big Matthew Golden catch at the end, Memphis, I was a crazy comeback in that one. Even Rice and UTSA in triple overtime were all one score or less games. Well, I guess that's meaning eight points or less games. And in doing, looking at it like that, it's like just like any of those 
one score losses could have gone against you or better for you. And those one score wins could have gone worse for you too. So I think you got to kind of balance that vote, especially, and this really all comes to light because of Dr. Couture, uh, president of the university said back in 2016 in the major app white hiring cycle uh, that Houston is hoping to become a school. This is as of 2016 that fires coaches for going eight and four. Uh, and they were eight and five last year and needed the uh, bowl game to win and get there. Now, for what it's worth, um, they have changed some coaches. Uh, Brandon Jones and Shannon Dawson are both out. Um, Brandon Jones and Shannon Dawson, I guess, kind of left them on a cord, but certainly weren't like, you know, people just grasping to keep them and stay either. So there's something to do with that. Maybe there was some change over there. Um, on a scale of one to 10, though, to quickly answer the question, quickly answer the question on a toss, I'm going to say like a four. Um, I could see it getting as high as a six by like middle of next season to based on how the season is going for Houston. But I think with realistic expectations of going to the big 12, you got to realize like this is a whole different level of competition, a whole lot more competitive league. And frankly, like that kind of plays into his favor because if you have those realistic expectations, you can't possibly be expecting a like 10 games, 10 win season going into it. Now, after watching it play out of like Donovan Smith becomes the next Cam Newton or so suddenly you're talking about it differently that changes later in the season. But as far as going into the season goes, I think he's got to be at like a four. He had a lot of guys replaced on defense. Um, you got to find a new quarterback and go into a new league, right? It's more about like how well do you play in those non-conference games and like do you put out a competitive product in the field and those kinds of things. Now, two, three years down the line, further into that contract and buyout, we're talking about a whole lot different thing, right? Um, also, Theoretically, you're recruiting big full players by then. I think this thing can go up really, really quickly. But going into the season, I'm still like a four on it. So I guess that's below a five. And so on a very binary scale, hot, not hot. I guess maybe he's right. Um, and, and I don't mean to say I don't. There are things I like about Dana a whole lot. So I, I know people online like to hate on the guy. But that's where I'm at on it. Um, the other football-specific question uh, came from Mike and Katie about what the latest on the quarterback battle is. And, man, I appreciate the question. They seem me a chance to talk about it. I assume this question popped up because uh, there's a Lucas Coley workout video went out. He's working with his trainer. And what I loved about that was he's clearly working on putting zip on the ball out into the outside of the football field, like out at the edges, both in the short, intermediate, and deep passes. Um, I've always thought in watching his tape or the kind of stuff we saw him in the spring that Coley does a good job putting the ball in between the numbers and hashes. Really good job in the middle of the field being really, really accurate when you have to be. That outside stuff and his arm strength is kind of a question mark to me. And it seems to be zipping out there pretty well, but we don't have any videos from Donovan Smith. So it's not like a competitive kind of situation in that instance. And for what it's worth, um, FanDuel, if you're looking at like who they're favoring, FanDuel actually has Donovan Smith on their Heisman potentials list. It's like plus 50,000, right? But like he is on the list and Lucas Coley is not that in case to me that FanDuel national people maybe think he's got an edge. Dana Holgerson has been held, holding firm that he has not picked one, but did not get to see a spring game where one of them would have gotten picked. Um, I think they've got different st strengths. And so right now it looks like they're going to season playing both and we'll see how that comes out. Um, Smith is more of a power running guy. He's got experience in the big 12. He is a pro size quarterback, whatever that's worth. Um, Lucas Coley has played in the system with Dana for a while. Um, and again, he has that great accuracy over the middle of the field, whereas Donovan Smith has thrown some picks in the past to Houston, frankly, when he's at Tech. Um, they both are transfers in, but Coley came a year earlier. That's, you know, hence that uh, getting to play in the system, even if it's just at practice for Dana. Um, they both appear to have for what it's worth the good leadership qualities you want in all those moments off the field or in front of cameras you would deem necessary. Um, so I don't think in uh, any assumption I could make, would be that they lose somebody and going one or the other on that. Um, I think that, you know, they both do run the football. So your offense can be somewhat similar as far as who's on the field. When um, I, I think Donovan Smith is more of a downhill guy and Coley likes to hit off tack a little bit more, but that's kind of semantics. They both run the football very, very well. And so I'm not sure. I'm sorry to Mike and Katie that I don't have a better answer for that. Um, now we, we have other questions to get to that are kind of more football or broader spectrum kind of stuff. But first I want to talk to you some about, a delicious snack that uh, you can have any option, not just two options like Houston as a quarterback, but any option to have. And that is built bar. Now I'm going to push these built bar cookie dough chunk puffs 
these right here are my new favorite. Um, but I'm going to tell you that if you're looking for a delicious snack and don't want all the sugar and calories and you need to get the best pr tasting protein bar out there, you got to try these Built Bars. They're healthy and taste amazing. But what makes them so good? For starters, they're 100% covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and cookies and cream. Uh, I'm not really sure how Built does it. But they have all of these great flavors and amazing macros. 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and swapping 17 grams of protein in most bars. This bar itself, my favorite, has 160 calories. Uh, let me go to, where was it? Uh, 8 total sugars and uh, 15 grams of protein in this cookie dough, cookie dough bar each morning. It's great to grab on your way out the door for breakfast. Highly recommend going to built.com and getting some or... If you can't wait that long, go to your local Walmart or Sands Club today and get your uh, you get your more specialty and specific at built.com. That's right. You can go to your local Walmart today, walk up the pharmacy section, get a four-bar box of flavors like cookies and cream, double chocolate bar, or coconut puff. You can also go to Sam's Club and get a 13-bar box with hit flavors like brownie batter puff and churro puff. Thank me later. Go to built.com. They're just the best things. Built.com. All right. So I will say... Um, and looking at some of these other questions, the only other one that kind of ties it all for a nice like transition moment would, to football would be one from Marcus in Houston. Um, Marcus asked, why do you always focus on... This felt like a dig, Marcus, for what it's worth. Um, why do you always focus on conference expansion? Houston's in. That's the conference. Leave it. Now, admittedly, part of what Marcus is saying here is correct. Houston is in the Big 12 kind of no matter who else joins it for the next few years. And that's just the way it's going to be, kind of regardless of what else happens. Um, now, my quick explanation would be, honestly, that's what you guys watch. <laughs> I can watch. I can pay attention to what you guys are watching. I, I watch the clicks. I watch the comments. I watch the whatever. You guys tend to watch these things more when I talk about the conference realignment. I think there's excitement about the conference as part of that, honestly. I think there's some excitement about where Houston could be playing. And so that's why I talk about it so much, Marcus, is because y'all seem to like talking about it. Y'all comment on it more. Y'all watch it more. Y'all listen to it more. That's why. <laughs> I don't mean to like spill the beans on how these things are made, but if y'all are watching it more, y'all don't watch the baseball clips as much, so I don't talk about baseball as much. <laughs> really, that, that's how that goes. Um but second, second, I will say that I think this directly impacts the growth of Houston Athletics, right? Um, the bigger brand and market will bring in bigger dollars by the 2031 deal, right? We talk about the Big 12 has the deal from uh, 25 to 2031, just a six-year deal, and they're re-upping for another one. The more teams you're adding to that means the bigger value you're getting in that 2031 deal when these are all re-upped and redone. Um, the the dollar figure is currently set at 31 and change, 31 million and change for the 2025 to 2020, uh, 31 seasons. Um, T revenues alone, that is. So that's not counting college football appearances, New Year's Six appearances, NCAA tournament units, any of that kind of stuff. Just TV dollars, you're getting over $31 million from the Big 12. Um, and frankly, adding key programs like the Sanders Colorado program or whomever would shape that conference as well um and in shaping that conference like if you add colorado and they make it to a college football playoff because they go to 12 and everyone likes voting against Dion and wants to see Dion in the playoff or whatever because it is a voted on thing right um then that adds to the total pot for the big 12 and if you think about like ncaa tournament appearances and you suddenly add like the gonzaga and yukon theory which is one theory that is out there about adding these basketball dominant programs you're adding more interly tournament units into the program as well and suddenly those dollars are rolling in to the big 12 um that's dollars and cents but then houston we know can use those dollars and cents to make things like facilities can do things like coaching contracts can do things like fan experience right like all of those kinds of things can happen as well. So that all ties in the story, and that's why I care so much about who else coming to the conference because they're going to directly impact how much money Houston makes in the conference. But it also has, and this is my third point, a direct on-the-field aspect, right? We joined the Big 12 from a fan's perspective to play better competition, right? That's the point of leaving the American Athletic Conference and moving into the big leagues is we felt like we got left out in the 90s. And it's our chance to prove that we belong in that big league level. Um, who's in and who's out? of that conference will change who that big league level is for us for like three fourths of football season and half of basketball season, right? If the conference gets huge as yes, it very quickly could, right? You know that your Mark wants to go coast to coast. He's an innovative guy that really wants to dominate every single team. He wants to have a 
Big 12 game at every single TV slot. And while Houston can op- occupy that central time zone, that may mean West Coast times. That may mean Thursday night games. That may mean East Coast times, right, et cetera. Um, if you're looking at divisions and pods and regions or other splits and divisions within a conference, suddenly you're looking at that whole thing and like, huh, that impacts who you're playing on a more regular basis even more, right? And so suddenly who's in the conference has a whole lot. Because like if you're adding Colorado and Arizona, that may not impact Houston quite the same way as adding like Memphis would. That's a much closer team that may be more realistic in our like schedule every year, right? And so like these kinds of things do matter. And then last, um, I got a theory on this actually not mattering a whole lot, but bigger picture, people look at keeping Houston in Houston as the biggest problem in Houston recruiting, right? If they can keep A&M and Texas Austin and LSU out at Arkansas, even out of the nest that is Houston, the best recruiting nest in the country, um, then theoretically that's better for Houston's programs. And if you're adding Arizona, Phoenix, right? You can add some San Diego state, you can theoretically add some Southern California into who we're recruiting. Say, hey, we're going to be out there playing in your backyard a couple times or every year or whatever. Come play here. We'll see your family. Uh, trust me, we'll see your family. I also worry that depending on who you're adding, they could be doing the exact same thing to Houston, right? They could be saying, oh, if we can get in that conference with Houston and those other Texas schools. We can recruit Houston and DFW, or we can recruit the state of Texas and sell those kids on playing it. Arizona State and join the party, but also getting to play at home so often. Now, admittedly, right? Like that's maybe me extrapolating too far. Maybe that's a reason to not want these extravagantly large conferences. But I do think that that's got to have something to do with it in my head as far as like playing through what the different realistic uh, benefits and, and drawbacks would be. Um, That's really all for the football questions, and that really wasn't even directly a football question, but it felt somewhat tied. I'm trying to fit two questions a segment in here, so I'll talk some. The the next question came from a guy named Jason in Houston. Jason asked, um, well, I guess I should go back to the top of the question. He said, should head baseball coach Todd Winning keep his job if the Houston Cougars miss the College World Series? Um, I guess he sent this before before they'd missed it. They have missed it at this point. Um, East Carolina or ECU had the exact same conference or nearly the exact same conference record. I should point, I was about to tell them that they didn't, but nearly the exact same conference record and made it at large as a two seed. Um, again, that's Jason and Houston. Thank you for the baseball question. Thank you for listening to the baseball segments. I, I like talking about the Cougar baseball team. They had a crazy good year. We should point out um, they did come up just short in a double header on Saturday. They lost the second game, 11 to eight. The tying run was at the plate and they lost the baseball game. Um, crazy run for the Cougs amidst all the injuries and chaos in the American Athletic Conference. They won every regular season. Uh, conference series, which is the first time they've done that in any conference. It's a big, big accomplishment for the Cougs. Um, They finished at 36 and 23, 17 and six in conference play, just a half game back from that regular season title to those East Carolina pirates. That was mentioned. The question from Jason, Uh, again, they lost the double, double, that double header to Tulane Uh, for what it's worth. They had swept Tulane in the regular season um, and had beaten Tulane earlier that day. The story of, baseball for what's right, worth right now in the American Athletic Conference is Tulane. Tulane had an abysmal record throughout the season, but got hot in the conference tournament and beat Houston at the gate, beat Houston at the end and won the whole thing on Sunday. They got an automatic bid and only made a four seed themselves, right? Like that's the kind of season they had. Um, I think the interesting criticism of Todd winning on Twitter and online became very quickly that the thing that kept Houston out of the big college world series was their conference res their non-conference resume where they played teams like Oklahoma and got swept. Um, who else they have that they played here? Uh, they played Cal uh, and lost a couple of that one um, that <laughs> they played a couple different teams across the board here that were kind of big time as well. But like they also got swept by UT Rio Grande Valley. It was a good baseball program, but not like a power five baseball program. Like you'd think um, their non-conference schedule for lack of a better phrase was simple, was easy um, played a lot of Texas area schools, uh, Texas and adjoining states w- with the addition of Cal, right? Um, and since their non-conference schedule was so easy and they didn't do very well, 
even though they had a very comparable conference uh, season and conference tournament to East Carolina, the East Carolina Pirates were always going to be farther ranked ahead than them. I mean, frankly, uh, East Carolina had one of the more difficult non-conference schedules in the country, and East Carolina finished, where did I have it, uh, 45 and 17 uh, and 25 and 11 in non-conference baseball games. Uh, that's a much stronger schedule with a much better record. Um, now, I think what's interesting is between when this question was at, when I got this question and us talking right now, Houston has fired their pitching coach. Um, and frankly, I think what's interesting is that they just fired their pitching coach after a season in which they used 14 different pitchers and didn't really have a number one by season's end. They lost, I believe my count here is five starting pitchers. If it, if I'm wrong there, tell me down below, but I believe they lost five starting pitchers or guys that would have been starting pitchers over the course of the season to injury. And I think fair or unfair here, uh, Jason Houston, fair or unfair pitching coaches and managers or coaches of baseball teams get blamed a lot for these pitching injuries because pitching is inevitably going to lead to an injury. So part of your job as a coach or manager of the pitchers is to make sure you're managing things like pitch counts and innings and days rest and workouts and rehab and all of those kinds of things. Right. And so um, bluntly, it looks like Whitting may have kept his job and for and we should say, Duarte of the Chronicle reported that Whitting is keeping his job as Houston moves into the Big 12, but he may have kept his job by passing the buck there off to his pitching coach specifically, because I think that would be the ultimate criticism of this team on the field is that because their pitchers were hurt, they kind of dug themselves in a hole where they had to score like eight plus runs a game just to win the games. And they did. And it was fun. It was great brand of baseball. I love watching offensive baseball, but the fair criticism of coach Whitting would be, a, the non-conference scheduling is kind of up to him. He's been here long enough to have picked that schedule. What does that say about us there, right? And then B, someone has to be at fault for not protecting the kids from themselves and having them throw. Sometimes you get bad luck, but having that many pitchers and that much bad luck kind of is a interesting. I don't know. At the major league level, you'd be firing managers. And so I feel like it's fair to say, like, the next thing down would be to fire somebody, and they did that with the pitching coach. Um, now, we'll point out, like, Part of the reason winning kept his job is because it is the first time in program history that they've won every conference series, regardless of what conference they're in. That's a really, really high note to go into the Big 12 in. Even though the Big 12 is a great baseball conference, it's a really, really high note for sure, right? Um, second, I think that the interesting thing is they had things like newcomer of the year. They had new face on the team from transfers and things like that. And that also ties itself to winning. Winning went out and got guys – uh, like jo like uh, Justin Murray from Dartmouth, right? Like, like getting guys to come in and make big, I mean, Justin Murray is newcomer of the year in the conference. He's a dr Dartmouth transfer, right? Dartmouth is like good at baseball for the Ivy League, but not like that, right? And he went on and got that guy, pulled him in and turned him into, frankly, a weird, we talked about with Jeremy Branham a couple of days ago or a couple of episodes ago about like, I guess about, about a week ago. But he's like Shohei Otani light for the, for the American Athletic Conference, right? Like he was an incredible baseball player this season. So I think that's why Whitting kept his job. We got one more question that kind of ties to two sports in the third segment. And I want to give it its due time. So let's jump on in and talk some about um, a question from Kyle in Conroe. All right. Kyle in Conroe asks, <laughs> and this is so simple. I have to kind of ask a question back, but... Why does Houston look done in the transfer portal? That's it. That's the whole question. But Colin Connell, thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for asking. Um, I can't tell this is for basketball or football. I, I can't tell. So I'm going to answer it kind of in both angles to end the show. But from a basketball perspective, Houston does have one scholarship left available. Um, and frankly, I think it's worth pointing out that especially in May and June, Samson is always and he mentioned this to talk when talking to andy Yanez and uh chris gardner on the lunch break the, the show that they do which is a good show good houston based show um he mentioned to them that like he enjoys keeping that last scholarship spot open as long as possible quote just in case right you don't know what's going to show up and there hadn't been a whole lot of examples of this with transfer report being what it is that just in case what if moment is very very valuable because you don't know Who's going to become available randomly in college basketball? It's a big what if kind of spot, but if someone, you know, 
pulls back from the NBA draft, 10 pick an agent is looking for someone in college basketball. I guess the agent thing's kind of dead now anyway. But looking for done looking for a spot in college basketball, right? You've got a spot open where other places have to kind of clear a spot up, right? Um, or if they like Grant Nelson, the guy we talked about, it's been a while now, but he um North Dakota State kid, right? He's the sixth ranked overall transfer. He's in the NBA draft process right now. He's a six eleven power forward and Yes, he's got holes in his game. I wish he'd use his left hand more, but he creates. He finishes around the rim. He's big, strong, athletic, and shoots pretty well from distance as well at 6'11". Um, if he were to let be like, okay, my recruitment's open, Houston's got a spot, right? Whereas if they use that, that last scholarship right now on a guy that would kind of fit at the end of the bench as a role player, you know, eh, right? Like, is that really helping the cause as much as keeping the spot open to potentially add that game changing home run type guy at a later date might be, I don't know. I, I think that Sam, a Samson, Samson company have earned the right for all trust at all times. But B, I think that that makes some sense because truthfully they've got a strong rotation right now. I mean, they've got shed, they've got crier, they've got done. They got Wani and they got JB air Francis. They got some freshman bigs that'll come in and play fill in roles throughout the season. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you're going to love Cordell Jefferson from Arlington Martin High School. Um, kid is so good at basketball. I know he's a guard. We've got a lot of guards, and so I don't know you know, what his minutes will look like and all that, but he's so fun to watch. Um, super, super competitive kid. So I say that to say that that spot being open actually makes some sense to me. Now, if you're talking about football, my mind has kind of been shifted on this thanks to Brian Smith, who came on the show a couple weeks ago, um, and that's kind of why I wanted to have him on the show a couple weeks ago. Um Houston and Dana Holgerson have always made a living on JUCO guys, right? JUCO guys being the go out and get guys from the junior college level that come in and play right away, typically as role guy, but sometimes you get a guy like a Tank Dell that does a lot more than just a role guy, right? Um, I think the transfer portal is sexy and new and different, but truthfully, like the JUCO thing is kind of what Houston's been known for, and like that seems to be the way things are going. I mean, they're recruiting office alignment off the JUCO list right now. Some of the top JUCO guys in the country that are available are looking at Houston because of that. Now, I understand that like some blue bloods are finding guys that are key pieces off that transfer portal list. And it feels like Houston got left off of that. But I think as Houston is doing what I'm going to start calling brand building, meaning like it's not quite a blue blood, but they are building towards one, hopefully in the near future, right? As Houston's brand building, they're more likely to do that with these guys, the Juco guys that have a different kind of chip on their shoulder than transfer guys, right? The guys who were under-recruited at a high school or the guys that, uh, you know, had a grade problem but got it fixed or, you know, whatever, right? Or, or maybe got in trouble once in high school and went over, got straightened out at Juco. Whatever the case may be, finding those kinds of guys that have that chip on their shoulder have figured themselves out and figured out how to grow up a little bit whatever the case may be, I guess, and then come to Houston, those guys tend to do very, very well under a guy like Dana, who kind of has a chip on his shoulder himself. And for what it's worth, even if you look at the Houston Juco guys, that's kind of what they did there too, right? You you had FIU transfers, right? Guys that should have been Power 5 guys out of the gate. Uh, A.J. Halsey, right, goes into Mexico and kills it. Right, not quite a JUCO, but functionally kind of the same thing. Under recruited at a high school, and then ends up at Houston off the transfer port. Right, that seems to be the mo of this program, and I don't hate it. I don't hate it, but I do think it means you're going to see us wait a little bit before we get too involved in the transfer portal. We're going to be more of that JUCO kind of route. And again, if it works, going to become more Tank Dells. I might be in favor of it. Tell me what you think, though. First of all, if you asked a question and I did not answer it well or I did not answer it thoroughly enough for you, tell me in the comments down below or you can find me on Twitter at Painsworth 512 P-A-I-N-S-W-O-R-T-H-512 on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all your favorite social media handles. We have to talk all things Cougs. I also talk Rockets, Astros, Texans, uh, Houston Cougar, basketball, baseball, football, whatever. You want to talk about all year long and find me at Painsworth512 on Twitter, Instagram, and all my favorite social media handles. Thank you so much for, for making Locked on Cougs your first listen of the day today. For your second listen, 
I'm going to recommend Locked on College Basketball because Andy and Isaac are having a fun time doing off-season college basketball content. We're a little bit light on the college basketball today on today's episode, but we know Houston's poised to have another big basketball season next year, and they're covering all things college basketball. So make sure you go li- give them a listen and subscribe. They're about to pass 1,000 subscribers if they haven't yet, so make sure you go hit subscribe with them. Hit subscribe down low for us as well. Hit like, comment, do all the wonderful things up with the podcast. Locked on Cougs is a proud member of Locked on Podcast Network. That means your team every day.